hello everyone uh, good afternoon uh, welcome to another episode of meet the young professionals where we invite the non-resident uh, bangladeshis who were once part of the ieee bangladesh section and now move to different parts of the world for their career opportunities it's uh, my great privilege today to invite uh, dr tanvir ahmed bhuya uh, as a resource speaker uh, dr tanvir completed his bsc engineering and msc engineering in tripoli from buet dhaka and phd in biomedical engineering from alborg university denmark he is currently working in oticon a leading company in hearing aids and he started his career as a research engineer in the institute of cardiac modeling france and uh, ericsson research center denmark before joining the rnd in oticon and his research interests include cardiac electrophysiology sensor fusion algorithm development for wearable sensor based uh, stress estimation so without further ado i would like to invite dr uh, bhuya to give his talk today thank you very much uh, sajid for inviting me and hello all fellow uh, buitians assalamu alaikum and welcome to my talk uh, i am being being very honored to uh, to be invited for such a talk that uh, i have an opportunity to share my research in 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 my in my uh, previous university my beloved university at buet um, i'm going to share my screen now um, i have prepared a small presentation actually it's not a small maybe you call it medium uh, it should be coming now can you see my screen? Uh, yes. That's great. Uh, yes. So basically, I uh, will uh, talk uh, on the utilization of sensors and how can we use it in in the audiological application. I have chosen this specific. Uh, path or specific uh, aspect of uh, sensors because this is the uh, area i am currently working and i can give you an overview on uh, different type of uh, uh, um, uh, challenges we currently have and how we are envisioning to solve it through the sensors technology um, just to give you an idea uh, about my academic background, uh, I have uh, finished my bachelor from Buet uh, in Tripoli with my major in communication and minor in electronics. With I had my bachelor thesis on the performance analysis of free space optical code division multiple access scheme in an atmospheric turbulence challenge with uh, with uh, yeah it's, uh, with my uh, with, with the supervisor with Satyaprasad sir. And in the, my master's was a bit interesting because uh, first part of my master's uh, was completed at Buet while, while I finished my coursework. And uh, interestingly, I got an opportunity to, uh, uh, to go to uh, Denmark uh, with an uh, Erasmus Mundus uh, scholarship uh, where I, uh, I was a visiting master's student in, in the, in the uh, Department of Electronic System in Albert University. There I uh, completed my, uh, or I worked on my master's thesis for, for one year, and the topic was uh, RFID-based localization system, um, exploiting multiplicity, multiplicity and diversity of uh, RFID tags. So it, uh, in principle, it was basically a non-linear optimization problem using uh, receive signal strength and angle of arrival, and how can we localize uh, the tagged object in an inter, inter scenario. My PhD was, uh, in the same university, but in a separate department, it's called the Department of Health Science and Technology. Uh, there I worked uh, on electrocardiographic measurements on drug, drug induced repolarization changes. More specifically, it's uh, the markers on the ECG uh, that can uh, reflect the propensity of, uh, of cardio, uh, cardiac arrhythmia when there are some of the drugs which block the potassium channels uh, uh, in, in, the, in the action potential uh, scenario in, an, in, the, in the heart. So that's more or less my uh, background, uh, academic background. And so uh, right after that, I, my, my professional career actually started first in 
July 2016, I started working uh, as a as a research engineer in in France, where uh, the 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 research institute was uh, basically specialized for uh, cardiac research and it's called the institute for cardiac modeling and there i, uh, I worked not much time around five or six months uh, and my task was basically uh, uh, to uh, do some simulation while we can we could reconstruct the the signal which we get uh, from ECG signal which you get from the torso or on the chest how that could uh, be reflected on the epicardium itself uh, if we know some transfer function uh, from from torso to the heart uh, in order to study some uh, uh, some electrical mapping of uh, atrial fibrillation when uh, there are some atrial fibrillation happening uh, how this uh, electrical circuit uh, actually generates and diminishes uh, in that kind of uh, application afterwards I got returned in Denmark and started working in as a postdoc in what's called Ericsson Research Center uh, this research center is specialized in in uh, in, uh, in 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 the research of uh, um, audiological uh, uh, application um, the uh, so how how the hearing aid or hearing impaired uh, uh, subjects uh, people can perceive sound more more in a more better way um, in those kind of uh, aspects there i work on a project european project was called uh, cognitive control of hearing aid i will come back to that in in my slides afterwards um, i uh, i was uh, working with uh, what's called inertial sensors uh, in um, to estimate some uh, some uh, head orientation uh, using sensor fusions um, and also some physiological uh, signals to uh, estimate stress. Uh, so uh, I will come back at big details in afterwards. Uh, after working in the in the, uh, in the research institute, I started working in the company called Oticon. And just for your information, this Ericsson Research Center is actually a part of Oticon. So it's a research branch of a company. Then I uh, I I, uh, I went uh, I became a development engineer in in the R and D of uh, Oticon. Uh, so as a development engineer, I worked in a in a in a group which is called Feedback and Sensor Integration. And um, I am still working that group now. Uh, have become a specialist in uh, uh, in the last month, so still uh, working or or continuing my work as as I was doing since uh, coming in Oticon. Um, so basically, that's kind of uh, summarize my professional uh, background. And now I will go to more interesting part. Uh, I would like to first introduce you with what is called a hearing aid. Uh, what is a hearing aid? Because right now we have a lot of uh, wearables, Apple iPod, um, uh, whatever you say, um, headphones, anything. So what how is it different from a hearing aid so hearing aid is actually a kind of medicine you can say for hearing impaired people um, so how does it work basically in the hearing aid uh, it gives and customize uh, audiological experience meaning that um, for people with less of hearing or loss of hearing um, there is something called audiogram where uh, hearing care professional first estimate in which uh, center frequencies uh, um, how much is the loss of the hearing aid, aid, uh, hearing uh, capability in terms of decibel afterwards uh, the they program the hearing aid to actually compensate for those frequencies and based on the prescription of the uh, of the doctor and then uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, system or that prescription is embedded on in the or or adjusted in the hearing aid and then that it gives an kind of optimal sound or as you would uh, hear in a normal hearing um, scenario so that's kind of the very basic work how a hearing aid uh, uh, functions as you see, I have uh, attached uh, three figure uh, photos for how uh, it is uh, charged, how it is mounted on the people's ear, and how is its size with respect to my hand. Um, it's a very small device. Uh, it has its own DSP chip inside it, uh, where we can program something. Uh, can you still hear me? I don't know. 
yes we can yes thank you i just don't to know because i'm not yeah so um, uh, so being a very small and uh, very small device it has of course some limitation is that uh, Whenever we want to introduce some new algorithms or uh, or, or or any any other sensors, uh, so to say, the first thing we need to think about is battery life. How much the other uh, extra add-on will drain power? And because the first first thing of a hearing aid is to provide optimal sound, so that's the that's the primary goal. What is additional is how to improve the, um, the experience or, or how can it help the user a bit uh, more, give, uh, give some delta improvement. So we have to ensure that uh, uh, we don't degrade the battery life, just introducing a lot of uh, interesting thing. Um, and being uh, very limited, uh, uh, cheap uh, uh, signal processing implemented there, it's not always uh, that all algorithms can be implemented. It has to be uh, quite uh, optimal, and uh, sometimes you need to find a way how to tweak the algorithm so that it's it's easy to implement. So there are lots of other uh, um, uh, consideration while talking about hearing aid. Uh, so what's the typical function? Uh, first, hearing aid uh, in hearing aid uh, actually have uh, two basic uh, capabilities and that's that is that, that's something it uh, make make it different from normal uh, sound enhancing devices first of all is suppress noise if you're hearing and uh, there is a lot of noise hearing it should be able to suppress uh, background noise uh, uh, with respect to the target talker uh, who, who you want to hear or who the hearing uh, impaired user want to hear and when i say target talker is because hearing aid has a capability of uh, of uh, of implementing uh, a special filter, meaning that uh, any any voice coming from the front with certain span of uh, uh, of a width, uh, it will be uh, it will be amplified, and anything else coming from side or back will be uh, attenuated. So this is a kind of special filter uh, already implemented in the hearing aid and different companies actually com mm, uh, compete, compete each other, how, how narrow or how precise this gain map uh, can be. As you see in the figure, uh, uh, this uh, user here, uh, I can just make a pointer. The user here is actually focusing on this person and the, he has a certain gain map, meaning that this is the place he will hear and everything from outside will be kind of attenuated. So this is the basic principle of a hearing aid. Um, uh, just uh, to give you a bit of uh, depth, how does it, it work? So basically, uh, the, uh, a, a special filter with some weight is designed with, uh, with I, I'll, I'll not go too much details on uh, about it, but um, in the hearing aid, I, I can show you that there are uh, two mics, one here and here. They have a different phys physical location. So uh, assuming that uh, there's a sound source coming from one side and it will have different time of arrival in these uh, two uh, microphones. And using this time different of arrivals, we can uh, actually this uh, beam former, what is called uh, this gain map or beam former is generated. So this gives a pattern saying that anything coming from zero plus minus certain degree will be amplified or kept as it is. Anything coming from other, uh, other uh, direction will be attenuated. And this is the kind of uh, weight of the of the of the of the filter that uh, that that will uh, this as i said is an special filter so it will uh, do uh, as as i said uh, with uh, the sounds in the coming from the source front and attenuate from the back so just a basic principle of uh, how you uh, can uh, think of a hearing aid would work this small device uh, actually does that um anyway now we will talk about some of the constraint we we have in the hearing aid and and how can we actually tackle those so uh, i will talk about uh, out of many constraints these four are, seems to be quite interesting just to share because it's uh, quite straightforward to understand so first of all as i said this beam forming i mean this uh, game map um, it only work when you when a hearing user aid user actually um, putting his uh, or uh, orienting his, his head towards the target. So uh, if think of a scenario where you are talking with uh, 
two, three people, everyone, uh, let's say plus minus 60 degree, one in the front. And then you would like to switch your attention to one talker to another. I mean, uh, if we are normal hearing it, we would just uh, look our, uh, our, use our eye gaze to actually point who I am want to hear. And I mean, in a socially, um, a social conversation uh, scenario. But you know, think about a hearing aid user who has a very hard time hearing, but uh, then he also wants to participate in this conversation. What he has to do is, uh, whenever he wants to switch the attention or in a follow the follow the competing talker, he has to orient his head in full to left, right, middle, which is quite unnatural. So these are the current constraint we have right now. Uh, that uh, it seems a bit unnatural uh, when when a hearing aid user uh, actually following a conversation or in a multi talker scenario, um, and. In not on not many countries or still there are a lot of uh, places uh, uh, having a hearing aid uh, is not something very fancy because people will think that uh, he's already an old man or old woman and then uh, it gives a social isolation so um, yeah this, this is really a big uh, a big uh, issue that needs to be addressed with, some, with something um, then uh, another uh, interest um, constraint is that so hearing instrument is a device it doesn't measure doesn't measure the intention of the user if he or she wants to hear or not. So if I say, okay, I am still uh, leaning my chair and doing thinking of something, but uh, as uh, hearing aid will understand that, okay, now I am actually focusing on something in my front. It will amplify the sound even though my intention is not to hear the sound. So. This is kind of a science fiction scenario where I will just think that I want to hear, I will hear, I will not hear, I will not hear. So uh, those kind of thing uh, is still, as you uh, think, uh, normally it's not doable right now. And another constraint is that it doesn't measure the li listening effort. So whether you are in an easy uh, listening condition or in a difficult listening condition, hearing it now cannot actually differentiate. Maybe you need less help in a normal condition when let's say you are talking about with four people and 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 then maybe you don't need that much of gain or something you have to adjust it with some button or something but it doesn't change automatically uh, like, uh, similar to if you are in a very let's say in a market with a lot of people are moving and doing something you also have to adjust your hearing aid by your app or something else but it doesn't do it automatically because it doesn't study the scene around you um, and also how much you want to hear, like you, if you have hard time hearing, it doesn't measure those kind of uh, uh, signals. And also it doesn't adapt, the fourth bullet point is movement of the user. So if you are moving, walking or sitting in a chair, so some of the, sometimes this context of sound actually changes. So now, right now it doesn't uh, do that uh, or take care of this constraint. So, so why I am saying this constraint, because I have chosen this point because these are currently being researched under 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 some extensive research at how can we improve. So right now I will talk about some possible solution to each of the points and um, and see how uh, potentially we may be able to solve. As I said, not of all, all algorithms can be implemented in the hearing aid, but at least we can theoretically gain some of the solution from uh, from studying this constraint. How can we basically? address this this constraint basically in principle is the sensors some of the sensors a lot of sensors can actually study different uh, uh, different scenario as i uh, this constraint say and then can feedback some of the decision uh, to the hearing aid that now you should do something uh, less help more help or just shut down whatever so first of all, I will uh, first. Uh, so I will just now uh, go through each of the points and then see how we can solve it. So first of all, as I said, uh, in uh, this beam forming part, where you need to orient your head on the target, so it's it's quite as I said, quite unnatural and socially constrained. How can we address that? One order, one way to switch the attention between talkers is that instead, uh, think of uh, you when you are in a, in a talking with several, several friends. And what you would do if a person to the right is talking, a person to the left is talking, you would just use your eye gaze. I mean, you will just look in his eye, uh, his lips to lip reading or whatever. But it's not that you totally take your head to the to the person you want to hear. 
it's more like your your eye gaze you're looking and left and right so it's more of an eye gaze less of your head and some of in our research it shows that it's it's actually a bit quite faster to switch attention if you look in your eye gaze so you can see this uh, this this figure uh, here where the the red one is uh, your eye gaze is uh, the person's eye gaze signal and blue one is a uh, head uh, signal so there were two uh, talkers. Uh, the one was plus 30 degree, one was minus 30 degree, one was zero. And he was told to, okay, can you switch your attention to the to the left to middle? And without uh, saying anything the, that you use your eye or use your head, whatever. But the, you can see that it's quite fast that it take a fraction of second, uh, around 200 and 250 millisecond when one people try to switch his attention from one to talker to another. While if you use head, it takes close to one second to change your attention. Um, so in principle, if we can somehow orient this beam former or what this gain pattern based on the eye guess, it will be much faster and much more natural. Now your question could be, okay, we know that eye guess is nice, very good, uh, very fast, but you are still talking about a hearing aid. How can you get an eye guess? Uh, this is, uh, is it, does it make sense actually? Uh, interestingly, yes, it does. We have some study where we showed that, uh, that if you have electrodes in the, in the eye, in the, in your hearing aid, um, so you, you have seen that uh, the hearing aid is a bit of uh, some dome that goes into the air canal where you get the sound. If we can somehow embed some electrode on those and get what is called electro or, uh, air electroencephalogram with air EEG signal. And we have seen that um, this air EEG signal that we get from the, from the air canal is actually uh, uh, contaminated by your eye gaze, which is called electrooculogram. So if you look left and right, you will have a strong bias in the air EEG signal. So think about, uh, I have a, uh, electrode one in each ear, and then I have uh, some EEG amplifier. I'm not showing that because it's a bit of confidential. So just an EEG amplifier, and then it can actually and say. So I, it was uh, one of the test subjects uh, having two electrodes in one in each ear, and was saying that okay, can you do something uh, similar to uh, this? Left, middle, right. Uh, look left, middle, right, and you can see this is a quite distinct signal. You can see that left, middle, right, left, middle, right. Very. Um, uh, the, so you, you can see that when you have a switch your attention, there's a very high jump in the amplitude, which is uh, called saccade. And um, then you, if you are looking still in the in that uh, that position, there will be some uh, uh, drift, but it's still in the same range. Um, so this is called a fixation. So any I guess is uh, actually a, a combination of a saccade, this jump and fixation, like a stable stability. So you can easily see that uh, this is a quite clean signal uh, we may be able to use to steer the beam former. So this is one way to tackle the issue that we can uh, use the air EEG, uh, air EOG signal, and then, then translate it to our eye guess. So in principle, we can, uh, we can uh, then map this microvolt or millivolt uh, to, to certain horizontal angle. Uh, to to actually spend the I guess so from from microvolt to degrees or something uh, depending on what kind of uh, scale we use but that's how it is a possibility. The reason we have this kind of signal because I is a strong dipole meaning that uh, if you, you if you have a have, have a one channel left and right uh, ground to the right let's say channel in the right temple ground in the left temple and then your I guess is a uh, Actually, a di dipole means that it has a strong positive and negative in the front, negative in the back. So if you look left, it will be a positive deflection. If you look right, it will be a negative deflection. So that's how you, uh, it is uh, understood that uh, we get this kind of strong bias in the EEG signal. So, so what we get from here is an eye guess, which is reference to the head. So if I have my head in the front, I will get, let's say, plus minus uh, uh, 60 degree. If I, again, look in the left, it will be a plus minus 60 degree. But now you have seen my head is moved to a certain degree. So in order to get this absolute eye guess, we also need to know how much you have turned your head. Because 
because it's also natural that you, you don't use your head totally to the people person you want to hear if they are uh, if they are quite separated and you are asked to follow the conversation what you will do you will first use your eye then a little bit of your head so in order to get that information we also need to know how much you have moved your head so this is actually a very well-known problem which is uh, called uh, estimating the Euler angles so Euler angle is uh, how much of uh, rotation angle uh, in each of the axes uh, you can make. So uh, assuming this is X, Y, and Z axis, you can see that if you do this, this is a roll. If you look up and down, this is a pitch, and this is a Yao angle, I mean this horizontal plane. So these uh, angles are quite important because that will, uh, that will be used as a reference to your um, to your uh, to your eye guess to to eventually estimate what is called absolute eye guess is which is not reference to the head but on the global coordinate uh, global orientation how can we actually uh, estimate those this is what we call imu inertial measurement units is this is another uh, this is actually a combination of sensors uh, generally found in a small package. And uh, in principle, if you have an iPhone or uh, some very advanced uh, latest phone, they also have uh, this sensor in inside. So um, uh, to give you an example, when you tilt your phone, then the, the screen becomes from, uh, from portrait to uh, landscape. This is because there's an IMU sensor uh, actually sensing that now you have uh, oriented your, your phone and then. So in principle, those kind of uh, sensor we can use. Um, so what is an IMU? IMU has actually uh, three different type of uh, sensors. One is accelerometer, one is gyro, one is magnetometer. So accelerometer, we I think more, most of you know what is accelerometer. It's basically uh, the the estimation of gravity. So um, if you tilt or some way, it will give a projection of the gravity vector in three different different axes. So this is how you can measure this tilt of with respect to the gravity. Uh, gyro is the rate of uh, angular orientation, so angular rotation. So it will, if you move left and right, up and down, it will give a, a, a velocity measure of how much of this, uh, um, uh, in which velocity you have move, you have actually rotated with respect to the axis. Uh, in principle, gyro is kind of enough to find this because uh, if you want to, if you know the angular velocity and you want to know the angle, you need to just integrate over time. Uh, but the problem is this is a noisy uh, sensor and 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 it's not it's it, it has uh, uh, it has a strong bias so meaning that uh, if uh, if if you come back to the same orientation again it will uh, not come back to zero it will come back to something else uh, it's it's quite known problem for this kind of sensor but still you can use it and also this magnet magnetometer which is called magnetic field of the earth so sometimes you you, you also have it in your mobile this compass thing so that's uh, give you the estimation of the magnetic field uh, in that region where you are in. So it's also give you the, the component of the magnetic field in, in all three directions. So in principle, uh, one can use, even though all of the three sensors are not, uh, not perfect, but if we make a combination of these sensors, what is called sensor fusion, then we can uh, actually compensate uh, the, the noises in each sensor and come up with a better estimate. Uh, I'm not going through the details, but basically it's, you can use a very, uh, very uh, uh, state-of-the-art extended Kalman filter to, uh, uh, to estimate those, uh, those ang um, uh, angle from, from, the, from, from the IMU sensor. So right now on the top panel, I'm showing you uh, a ground truth, meaning that we have a, uh, some uh, optical sensor, uh, optical uh, or, or camera that uh, measure uh, this angle. So if I have a, uh, have a, have a device that I first do some, uh, some yaw, meaning that this, this movement and uh, then roll movement and then pitch movement, then I also have this sensor, say this IMU sensor, where I have all these three, all three signals, accelerometer, gyro, and magnetometer. Then I can actually, with a with a reasonable accuracy, can estimate the similar angle as in the ground truth from the IMU sensor. So, in fact, in principle, uh, combining this air EEG that I have showed you earlier, where you show the see the eye gaze and this IMU, we may estimate a global eye gaze, and that can be used to tackle the first problem where we have we don't need to move all head, but rather eye and quite natural movements. 
so this is a kind of uh, kind of indication that maybe we we can we are able to do that there might be lots of other ways where you can use a lot of machine learning algorithms where you study or train a model how you use, use your eg for i guess but uh, uh, this is one way uh, to use the um, stroke their signal processing algorithms to uh, estimate those kind of signals yes so uh, next constraint is that hearing it hearing instrument does not measure the intention of the user if he or she uh, wants to hear or not so this is a, a, a bit far reaching uh, luxury problem that uh, i don't want to hear then i don't want to hear it i will just use my mind to do it whether it is possible or not um, actually uh, we have shown in our research is, um, um, institute uh, we uh, we worked in a project called kokoha cognitive control of hearing aid there we have shown that uh, that what you hear in the brain so if you have several talkers two talkers talking to in front of you and you want to focus on one talker uh, so it has been shown in the eeg that the envelope of the sound is uh, actually matching the envelope and uh, matching the eeg signal so if you have a sound uh, if you have a sound and your eeg and somehow we can translate from one to another so uh, so so we 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 can see the envelope of the sound and then it transform it to the eeg what you exactly record from the from from your from uh, from your scalp and this is quite interesting because uh, we have uh, uh, shown that so we can either generate the 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 sound from the eeg itself or the other way around which is called this is that's why it's called forward model or inverse model and this has been quite a revolutionized uh, because we have already also showed a demo in in this project i i am not going to details but we have shown that uh, there were two talkers uh, in front of of a, of a person who, who had a full scalp eeg and, and he was asked to asked to uh, just uh, from his mind think about one or the other and 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 it was uh, the algorithm was uh, pretty it was a bit expensive algorithm it took like eight eight to ten seconds actually to switch the uh, tell the detector that now he has actually switched to the left talker or the right talker but um, uh, this is one of the paper from our research institute showing that this is called auditory attention uh, identification method uh, there there you can have this let's say this is a e in an eeg frame and uh, this is a sound frame and you can translate to the one, one to another by using a transfer function and uh, with a, with some noise so this is a kind of very linear uh, equation um, that can can be solved but of course this uh, b is the kind of model you, you need to train uh, and generate but i'm not going to details but as i said this is quite possible and has been shown in a full stop eeg while you you can you can actually translate the eeg to, uh, sound to the eeg signal um, so and and the, uh, your brain will uh, tune to the sound you want to hear so that's quite interesting and as i said this uh, i have uh, worked on this project is called cognitive control of hearing aid so the idea was that we will have several sound source uh, which we will uh, uh, will uh, isolate from each other using some some uh, some method and then amplify and then this person will hear and he will he will he has these two sources to choose from so basically if he choose uh, this one then um, we will have some easy measurement from here and try to see okay which of these two sound is is he actually attending then depending on this uh, correlation we can then amplify so either he, he can choose this one or this uh, the other one Anyway, so maybe the, I have addressed this first two problem. Now I'm going to a bit on, 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 on the physiological uh, sensors. So as the third problem says, the hearing in instrument cannot yet measure the listening effort and therefore doesn't react to the user's intent. Uh, so when I say effort, what is an effort? So this is a bell-shaped curve and, and valid for any kind of effort. Uh, uh, study uh, in, in the re effort research. Uh, so if you if you think that a two axis, which is x axis, is a task difficulty, y axis is an effort. So uh, it's more natural that if the task difficulty is quite low, you will put less effort. As the difficulty goes up, 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 you will 
be at some point in a in a knee point beyond that you will say okay it is now too difficult for me that i will no longer interested to uh, use my resources so when the task is very difficult you no longer put your effort so this is a typical uh, effort versus task difficulty curve uh, that any uh, any any res um, effort research uh, uh, actually envision for to find a parameter that would be uh, kind of symmetric this could be either this way this way depending on on the on the parameters the characteristics but it's a symmetric curve uh, so nowadays, I mean, uh, I don't know, uh, you, all, you may know that uh, lots of, there are lots of wearables in the market. Um, those uh, are capable of measuring the vital signs, uh, meaning the heart rate, blood pressure, heart rate variability, etc. And from there are quite a, millions of studies, uh, you, can, you can go through the literature, literature that uh, you have a different type of signature of stress from 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 your vital sign basically heart rate variability or or um, yeah blood pressure or some 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 other means so this uh, gives us an indication that while we have hearing aid in our in our ear we can also equally monitor those kind of vital signs to see how much the user is stressed whether he's put, putting effort or not because is the same sympathetic activation that uh, that that controls or that is ref that reflects your 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 effort estimate effort um, your your effort basically so the more effort you put in the more stressed you are and that is reflected uh, in your sympathetic activation and i am not going to much detail but this sympathetic activation has a lot of uh, actually the part of the sympathetic activation regulates your heart rate uh, you know that your heart rate is regulated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic activation but um, from the heart from the heart or some cardiac measure we can actually isolate this uh, sympathetic activation how much sympathetic uh, activation is currently going on because that would reflect how much stress you are and that would reflect how much effort you are putting in in a task so one of the state of the art literature is that uh, there are some measurement from 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 your heart that uh, where you can uh, isolate or you can measure the 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 sympathetic activation um, this is uh, one of the study uh, where we have a, have an ecg signal um, and another signal we also need which is called icg which is impedance cardiography so the impedance is if you put two electrode active electrode uh, across your torso um, because the the impedance of the heart is changing in every pump uh, because of, uh, of the valve opening and closing, you will also get another periodic signal. And this impedance is quite interesting because uh, from that we, we, we can measure what is called PEP, which is cardiac pre-ejection period. Um, so the cardiac pre-ejection period is basically the time difference between the Q point in the ECG and this B point in the ICG signal. And what uh, what's the definition of the PEP, pre-ejection period? It's, it's, the, it's actually the uh, me measuring the contractility of the heart. So if you are putting more effort, or you are, let's say, you are doing something physically challenging, your heart will pump a bit harder force. It's, it's the, called the uh, cardiac contractility. Uh, so the time difference when you have the electrical onset in the ECG, and time difference when you have this pump uh, from the from the ventricle. Uh, this time difference, time is actually characteriz uh, characterized by B point, and this time difference is the time of what is called pre ejection period. And a study shows that a lot of study you can find that this is completely uh, controlled by the sympathetic part uh, which uh, regulates the heart. So, if we can extract this signal, maybe we can relate to some of the when we put more effort, this uh, has some effect on this pre ejection period. So, interestingly, it's an opposite. So, the more effort you put the less the projection period is if the less effort you put the higher the projection period meaning that you have more now more time from your electrical signal from the pump much more relaxed uh, when you have longer pep so one of my phd student recently uh, uh, not recently but uh, yeah last year uh, sub, uh, published a paper where we had uh, this projection period and and uh, in the listening task how how you can uh, isolate uh, or how you can estimate the 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 listening effort if you are in a listening task and 
and you have this measurement of ECG and ICG. Of course, this is a, a very um, regulated laboratory uh, uh, study, but we wanted to first see if whether there is no variable variability in anything. Can we uh, measure this uh, this uh, effort from from the cardiac signals with with this parameter? That was uh, that's quite interesting, but. Uh, in principle, this is, as I said, uh, you need an electrode, ECG, ICG, uh, and ICG is something you need to take it across the across the torso, which is not quite straightforward. Um, all right, so ECG, this is a very uh, interesting and signal, and I also like it a lot because it was something I was working in my PhD. How, where, is it the heart only that you can get there some ECG? In principle, you can also get an, your ECG from the ear if you, with a certain uh, combination of uh, choice of reference uh, in the electrode, you can get a ECG-like signal uh, in, the, in, in your ear EEG measurements. So this is generally in the EEG study, this signal or this pulsatile uh, periodic signal is uh, filtered out, but uh, we can use this signal as an ECG signal. Uh, and then, uh, the mostly usable, uh, mostly used uh, sensor for measuring or estimating this vital sign is the PPG. Uh, and I think a lot of you know about this, uh, it's called photoplethysmography. So you have uh, this light sensor that uh, uh, the, the photo detector uh, actually gives a pulsatile signal, uh, which is uh, in correlation with your heart rate. Study shows that this uh, PPG signal and its combination of ECG and PPG signal, if we take these two, uh, simultaneously, we can also have a measurement, something like P ejection period that I have showed uh, two slides ago with this ECG and ICG. The measure is called a uh, pulse transit time, and and this is one of the major a um, lot of variables nowadays used for uh, for mapping the blood pressure. It's not directly related. There are some nonlinear models. Uh, there are actually quite uh, quite a number of models how you can uh, measure blood pressure from pulse transit time. But nevertheless, this is uh, a measure that can give you an estimation of your effort. Uh, how you can measure this pulse transit time, if you have a think of an ECG, and this is a PPG signal, I think uh, you can get it with a, with a, with a PPG module or, or even in your phone, uh, sometimes they have this heart rate monitor while, while you put, uh, put your finger and you can see these pulse transit signals. So the time difference between the ECG and, and the maximum upslope, or the, if you take the first derivative of this signal, then this time difference gives you what's called pulse transit time. And interestingly, it has, uh, there are quite some research show that pulse transit time actually decreases with, an, with stress and effort. So the more effort you put in, uh, the, the, the shorter it will go. So this gives us an indication that maybe with a wearable device, if we have capability of getting these signals, then we, we can actually say if the people or the test or the hearing impaired user actually having some difficulties understanding or he is uh, not uh, he's not his the, the hearing aid is working optimally for 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 his purpose or not um, this is kind of objective objective measure that uh, it will be monitored uh, 24 7 from from the hearing aid when he's wearing as i said uh, there are some nonlinear models uh, or uh, where you can uh, uh, somehow estimate this uh, blood pressure, which is a function of pulse transit time. It's just one of the model, but uh, in principle, there are a lot of model and it's uh, basically mostly used are machine learning models uh, to train a lot of, uh, lot of uh, PPG data uh, in, um, and then, uh, yeah, using like uh, artificial neural network or something that you can have an estimation of uh, uh, blood pressure. But um, I'm not, uh, in my presentation, not touching any ANN or DNN uh, new, um, machine learning part because uh, uh, it's, it requires, first of all, it requires a lot of data to train and, and it's also, of course, a different dimension or different way of thinking. I'm more focused on uh, studying the signals. So in our study uh, also in the lab, uh, when we calculated this pulse transit time, we got a, got a figure like this. Uh, so it was, uh, they were exposed to a different SNR environment. Uh, so uh, from plus four dB, which is uh, the signal is quite higher than the noise. And the, the right you go is minus 12 dB is the worst case where your, your, your target is very slow, 
low sound and your surrounding noise is quite high so it's very hard to hear and then the test subject was asked okay just uh, focus on what your target is uh, target is saying so we had to ask a question after every every um, every sentence the target was presented to the to the user and then we wanted to see a performance measure and this Last transit time. So initially, this plus 4 dB was the easier one, a bit difficult one, more difficult, more difficult, more difficult. So meaning that it was uh, initially he was putting uh, some effort, and then eventually he started to give up, which is quite nice because right now we have an air level measurement that can say this is. Um, uh, that can say actually that uh, whether uh, the test subject or hearing a user is having some difficulties in understanding uh, in a listening task and uh, uh, of course with a uh, with a caution that this is a, still a lab experiment so uh, in early stages um, one of the interesting challenge not an interesting very uninteresting challenge in the ppg is this motion noise i mean um, for for estimating this kind of uh, this kind of measurement, you need uh, to have a confidence on the data quality before. Otherwise, it will be a uh, lot of mess. Uh, so you can go to a different decision boundaries. So this is a very big field of research. So when you have an PPG in the air canal, maybe it's not uh, correctly placed, or it has some relative motion with respect respect to the respect to the air canal. Then you you introduce, introduce uh, some of uh, motion noise uh, so this is one of the um, head movement data so you did too much head movement and it actually had some relative motion between the skin and the detect photo detector so there's this some noise uh, uh, appeared there are also something called jaw movement or chewing uh, in some cases if you chew uh, you, if you chew some of your food uh, the 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 size of the ear canal also changes and that gives uh, this kind of uh, artifacts. So this is uh, also crucial to first be uh, quite uh, sure about the signal quality, or if there is a possibility to remove the signal, remove the noise, then we should do it before we do any kind of measurements. Um, we can either either look into a very normal way, like if we have an accelerometer in in the in the in the co-located uh, co-located with the photo detector then this uh, noise or motion noise is kind of uh, linear uh, linearly added to the signal and which uh, you can get uh, the the uh, the motion noise from the accelerometer with some very basic uh, adaptive filter you can model this noise and remove it and this is quite uh, interesting but of, of course this requires an accelerometer to be placed uh, quite uh, close to the photo detector then then you have an estimation of the noise how much you are moving so either this could be quite simple or this could be a more complex system where we have only a ppg signal then uh, assuming the motion noise and the ppg is kind of uncorrelated we can uh, we can give some assumption and you uh, use some some statistical method like independent component and then separate the clean ppg and artifact uh, this is just an example on how this is a motion corrupted suddenly a, a small segment is the motion came in then we can uh, separate out this motion noise from the from the signal um, of course there are uh, some some uh, previous assumptions saying that uh, motion and uh, this motion noise and the ppg are uncorrelated which may not be always true because sometimes if you are walking and and uh, the, the, this walking frequency is coming to your uh, to to your ppg uh, captured by your ppg uh, um, photo detector and if it is in the same uh, frequency range of your heart rate then sometimes it becomes very difficult to 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 uh, separate out so this is a, a kind of place we we need to look into more uh, finally, uh, I have just two more slides, but this is also how your movement, uh, hearing impaired users' movement, can have effect on on the on the on on the experience. So, assuming that uh, you have some good measure of your activity, which is by your accelerometer, that uh, as I said, it's, it can accelerometer can be used uh, for your tilt or your 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 step or whatever. Uh, you can use uh, for i mean those who make uh, who do, do the running uh, exercise every day you can see that uh, you in your phone you can see how many steps have you moved so that's basically your accelerometer counting your steps accelerate some algorithm counting your steps from your accelerometer recording so to say 
and also you can if you have a, some sort of a vital sign that can tell whether you are relaxed or more stressed condition so or we can basically uh, separate our activity in this four quadrant we can be either relaxed we can be in the light activity while we are walking we have a more cognitive stress where we are not uh, moving but uh, our our uh, our uh, cognitive stress is quite high that is reflected in in the in the heart rate or heart rate variability and also could be some vigorous activity where we do let's say do some workout or, or do some some uh, exercise and then both our motion um, our accelerometer saying that it's too much of uh, your body movement on also our 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 heart rate saying that this is quite a vigorous activity so uh, from this uh, two dimensional point we can uh, have an estimate of this which region we are so if you think of this uh, we can say okay these are example of food situation where you have a uh, different uh, activities so this is an interesting uh, place where we have this cognitive stress because let's say there's a hearing aid user here he's trying to understand uh, people around him but he, he actually putting a lot of effort uh, to understand because it's not quite easy how can to separate out those uh, kind of scenario where, uh, where he, people need more help in principle if we have an accelerometer signal you can see that while if you are moving we have some good readings in the accelerometer is saying that it's running and walking if you don't move uh, maybe we are uh, quite close to zero so this is one way for us to separate out whether you are moving or not moving and then if we uh, also look in the in the in your uh, heart or cardiac signal so you can see that this part here where it's quite relaxing uh, I mean, just the photos are for indication. I mean, just for example, uh, uh, then here uh, in this part, you can say that when uh, he's still, but he has quite hard time uh, because he's trying to understand, uh, maybe trying to conversation. So maybe using these two senses, we can separate out or identify or 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 uh, label the the scenario they are currently exposed to and do something or help uh, uh, according to their need so this is a way of using different sensors to identify uh, different uh, uh, environment uh, anyway so more or less i have addressed all four of these constraints uh, constraints uh, that uh, we are trying to uh, address with sensors um, in summary, uh, I think now you may have a good idea how a hearing instrument works, basically a hearing aid, uh, so to say, and how are different, uh, integ uh, while integrating different sensors, how can we have a better understanding of the context of uh, wire, uh, how it can help the users, whether in its uh, automatic control level, that hearing aid is much more uh, intelligent right now, that it, it can change its functionality based on what we want, also understanding how your body or you as a person uh, feeling um, or, or need your help based on your physiological data. So that's more or less my talk. Uh, thank you very much for attending and I am very happy to take question if you have any. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tanvi, first of all, for the wonderful talk. Uh, we have one question in the audience, uh, Mohammed Kafil mm -hmm. Islam. Since we don't have that many participants, I would like to request uh, Kafil to unmute and ask the question himself. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sajid, and thank you, Tanvir, for your nice presentation. It was a very interesting work that uh, you are doing currently. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I understand that uh, you have been using ECG. Uh, PPG, this kind of uh, cardiac relevant signal to actually estimate uh, the stress level, the cognitive stress level, which can also be estimated from EREG, as you mentioned, right? So I'm just wondering that uh, how about SCG, like seismocardiography or mm -hmm. uh, PCG, phonocardiogram? So these are all yes. related with cardiac signals. So exactly. have you try, tried this kind of signals? Yes. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, very relevant question. And yes, we have looked into that. Uh, so as I said, in the lab environment, when you are uh, very static, uh, and then uh, if you put an accelerometer on your chest, you can, uh, with a very good, uh, um, you get very good signal quality of, uh, of, of your, what's called a ballistocardiogram signal, or also, also this uh, seismocardiogram signal. And um, this requires, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so, so 
I didn't have a traditional seismocardiographic uh, sensor, but uh, using this uh, IMU, I have showed uh, we have uh, I recorded some 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 this uh, ballistic cardiographic signal, and it's also can reflect on used uh, to estimate uh, what is called this RJ interval. So if you have ECG and a VCG ballistic cardiographic signal, and then is this time difference between RJ is also correlated to your how much effort you are putting in. And this is uh, true in the sense if uh, if uh, the accelerometer does not capture any other motion than than the uh, than the than the cardiographic signal, um, and uh, this was uh, uh, thoroughly investigated. And it is difficult to think of of uh, of uh, hearing aid uh, users because it will be different type of uh, accelerometer. It will be more noisier than you would uh, get uh, from 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 a PPG or or EEG signal. So yes, that's a relevant uh, um, uh, sensor that to or relevant signal to use, um, and also it has lots of uh, other prospects. But um, yeah, for for our application, um, we choose not to go through that part. Yeah, I understand. But I mean, it gets I mean hoarse with the motion artifact, right? Because yes, exactly. Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, yeah, it picks up both the SCG as well as the acceleration and movement. Yes. So uh, on the note of motion artifact, you said that. Uh, adaptive filtering and uh, ICA you have tried and there are like uh, constraint like ICA needs you know multiple channels to work with on the other hand yes. adaptive filtering requires additional reference channel like the experimental yes. channel itself uh, mm -hmm. so I'm just uh, giving my comment that uh, because I work on EEG signal crossing so I know mm -hmm. that how this kind of motion artifact and other biological non-biological all the artifacts uh, how much they interfere your EEG so I found that uh, because these are all biomedical signals, which comes from a non-stationary, non-linear, random stochastic process, you know. Mm -hmm. So probably uh, Hilbert one transform based like empirical multi competition or wavelet transform may be a good choice because they can work both on signal channel and they does not require any, uh, any additional channel. Mm -hmm. like, unlike, unlike, you know, accelerometer. So mm -hmm. I think you may try on that as well to see if there is, I mean, obviously you can expect a lot of motion artifact. I can tell you that because a lot of motion artifacts picked up by the sensors. Therefore, yes. you need only a, a reliable mm -hmm. algorithm to detect and remotely detect the stress but at the same time it has to be computationally inexpensive so that exactly. it can work on real time right so uh, so i'm just uh, suggesting that you may try that with the transform mm -hmm. or emt if you have not done yet. yes thank, thank you. you very much uh, for your very nice suggestion um also uh, we have we have uh, this monitor of uh, what is called signal quality uh, index uh, um, so uh, the algorithms I've shown, um, so it can it can perform uh, with a, with a relatively uh, relatively uh, acceptable uh, performance uh, until uh, the signal quality is uh, is in certain range. So what we we do basically first see there was the signal quality in in, in a particular time duration and see okay if it is less than eighty percent then we know that uh, or we assume that there is some some artifact inside it and then try to correct it if uh, it is less than let's say forty percent so there's no signal i mean it's, it's just giving some 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 random uh, estimation of the signal quality um, it, it is shown that it does not does not improve the signal quality uh, after you uh, apply this kind of uh, filtering and so so there is a certain range in the um, non uh, non clean signal where we assume that this is the this is the range where we can expect uh, to have some improvement so this is one way also to pre-process uh, before going to these expensive algorithms uh, as well but uh, thank you for your very nice comment yeah i mean in that case i believe that uh, uh, are you going to continuously monitor the stress level or, or or for a certain period of time i mean just uh, this is subject to this is subject to the application uh, what i have shown, shown is basically uh, the 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 lab experiments and how we are gonna use it in a in a different level while we have a product this is of course first of all uh, uh, based on uh, other aspects like how much a battery life or how is the uh, how how frequently or how frequently we can we can turn on the PPG signal etc 
Um, I cannot give you much details about uh, this uh, specification, but uh, yeah, that depends on, on the use case, of course. So you are basically not only working on the signal processing algorithm, but the whole system. I mean, uh, are you designing any, yeah. uh, any ASIC application specific design? Uh, we we have we have our own uh, own own silicon engine group uh, okay. those who basically uh, designs those and we uh, as as in the in the in the part where we working with sensors basically the the signals we handle and and develop algorithms so this sometimes uh, this becomes a close collaboration with them okay how much we want and how much we, they can provide uh, in terms of uh, memories or processing power or how many multiplication they allow and this is a whole new <laughs> discussion Right, right. So if it is an on-chip processing, then obviously you have to take care of the, the complexity. Uh, very yes. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right. A lot of uh, useful discussions. And um, uh, before we go to the next question, I would like to briefly share my screen uh, first. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so this is a virtual certificate of uh, token of appreciation presented to Dr. Tanvir Ahmed for uh, being a speaker in our Meet the Young Professional webinar series. And he, uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, prepare the talk and coming to our uh, this occasion and sharing his talk with us. I am truly honored, uh, first of all, and I never thought of uh, getting invited by <laughs> from IEEE and Buet uh, to give uh, some some uh, share my research. And I really, really honored and thank you, Sajid, for for, for reaching, reaching me out. Uh, I'm very happy that to receive this certificate. Yeah, uh, no problem. Pleasure is all mine. And um, before we conclude the session, uh, is there any other questions or comments from the audience? Uh, if not, uh, I would like to thank everyone once again for coming to our talk and hopefully uh, you would continue. We will meet every Saturday at 9 p.m. to uh, continue the Meet the Young Professionals. So without further ado, thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you very much. Bye.